This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Section 9 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kwame Genov. YouTube.com forward slash C forward slash K W A M E G E N O V V. The Will to Live. Section 1. The days drag interminably in the semi darkness of the cell. The gong regulates my existence with depressing monotony. But the tenor of my thoughts has been changed by the note of the mysterious correspondent. In vain, I have been waiting for his appearance, yet the suggestion of escape has germinated hope. The will to live is beginning to assert itself, growing more imperative as the days go by. I wonder that my mind dwells upon suicide more and more rarely, ever more cursorily. The thought of self-destruction fills me with dismay. Every possibility of escape must first be exhausted, I reassure my troubled conscience. Surely I have no fear of death when the proper time arrives. But haste would be highly imprudent, worse, quite unnecessary. Indeed, it is my duty as a revolutionist to seize every opportunity for propaganda. Escape would afford me many occasions to serve the cause. It was thoughtless on my part to condemn that man Jamestown. I even resented his seemingly unforgivable delay in committing suicide, considering the impossible sentence of seventeen years. Indeed, I was unjust. Jamestown is, no doubt, forming his plans. It takes time to mature such an undertaking. One must first familiarize himself with the new surroundings, get one's bearings in the prison. So far, I have had but little chance to do so. Evidently, it is the policy of the authorities to keep me in solitary confinement, and in consequent ignorance of the intricate system of hallways, double gates, and winding passages. At liberty to leave this place, it would prove difficult for me to find, unaided, my way out. Oh, if I possessed the magic ring I dreamed of last night. It was a wonderful talisman, secreted, I fancied in the dream, by the goddess of the social revolution. I saw her quite distinctly, tall and commanding, the radiance of all-conquering love in her eyes. She stood at my bedside, a smile of surpassing gentleness suffusing the queenly countenance, her arm extended above me, half in blessing, half pointing toward the dark wall. Eagerly, I looked in the direction of the arched hand. There, in a crevice, something luminous glowed with the brilliancy of fresh dew in the morning sun. It was a heart-shaped ring cleft in the center. Its scintillion rays glorified the dark corner with the aureole of great hope. Impulsively, I reached out and pressed the parts of the ring into a close-fitting hole, when, lo, the rays burst into a fire that spread and instantly melted the iron and steel and dissolved the prison walls, disclosing to my enraptured gaze green fields and woods, and men and women playfully at work in the sunshine of freedom. And then, something dispelled the vision. Oh, if I had that magic heart now, to escape, to be free, maybe my unknown friend will yet keep his word. He is probably perfecting plans, or perhaps it is not safe for him to visit me. If my comrades could aid me, escape would be feasible but the girl and Fedya will never consider the possibility. No doubt they refrain from writing because they momentarily expect to hear of my suicide. How distraught the poor girl must be. Yet she should have written, it is now four days since my removal to the penitentiary. Every day I anxiously await the coming of the chaplain who distributes the mail. There he is. The quick, nervous step has become familiar to my ear. Expectantly, I follow his movements. I recognize the vigorous slam of the door and the click of the spring lock. The short steps patter on the bridge connecting the upper rotunda with the cell house and pass along the gallery. The solitary footfall amid the silence reminds me of the timid haste of one crossing a graveyard at night. Now the chaplain pauses. He is comparing the number of the wooden block hanging outside the cell with that on the letter. Someone has remembered a friend in prison. The steps continue and grow faint as the postman rounds the distant corner. He passes the cell row on the opposite side, ascends the topmost tier, and finally reaches the ground floor containing my cell. My heart beats faster as the sound approaches. There must surely be a letter for me. He is nearing the cell. He pauses. I can't see him yet, but I know he is comparing numbers. Perhaps the letter is for me. I hope the chaplain will make no mistake. 
range K, cell 6, number A7. Something light flaps on the door of the next cell, and the quick, short step has passed me by. No mail for me. Another twenty-four hours must elapse before I may receive a letter, and then, too, perhaps the faint shadow will not pause at my door. Section 2 The thought of my twenty-two-year sentence is driving me desperate. I would make use of any means, however terrible, to escape from this hell, to regain liberty. Liberty! What would it not offer me after this experience? I should have the greatest opportunity for revolutionary activity. I would choose Russia. The Mostanier has forsaken me. I will keep aloof, but they shall learn what a true revolutionist is capable of accomplishing. If there is a spark of manhood in them, they will blush for their despicable attitude toward my act, their shameful treatment of me. How eager they will then be to prove their confidence by exaggerated devotion, to salve their gu guilty conscience. I should not have to complain of a lack of financial aid, were I to inform our intimate circles of my plans regarding future activity in Russia. It would be glorious, glorious, S sh It's the chap lame. This has been a LibriVox recording. It was edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchists.